26. Apostolic Succession Our hope in discussing apostolic succession is to do so without animosity to any of the differing doctrines held on this subject, but rather with a concern for the truth. The term apostolic succession is usually used to describe a Roman Catholic doctrine, but because the underlying concept is common to all churches, we shall consider it in relation to all. The Reformation, after all, regarded the practice of the early church, as we see it in the New Testament, as normative. The Reformation claimed to be restoring the apostolic faith and practice so that it too claimed some kind of apostolic succession. There are essentially three versions of the doctrine. First, we have what is usually called the Roman Catholic version. Wilhelm, in The Catholic Encyclopedia, summarized the position thus. 1. That apostolic succession is found in the Roman Catholic Church. 2 that none of the separate churches have any valid claim to it. 3. That the Anglican Church, in particular, has broken away from apostolic unity. Wilhelm, in this summary, omits a key aspect of this doctrine, namely the role of the papacy as the transmitter of the succession. This is the reason for the exclusion of the Eastern Orthodox churches and of the Anglican Church. However, Wilhelm's approach is not very useful because it cites the Roman Catholic position and, in effect, lumps all other doctrines together. There is, however, a clear difference between the positions of Lutherans and Anglicans and between Anglicans and Reformed or Presbyterian churches. A more rewarding approach is to assume, with justice, that all churches claim some kind of succession from Christ and the Apostles, It is their doctrines of the nature of that succession which differ. Again, what is called the Roman Catholic doctrine has had dissent within that church through the centuries. We can best describe this first version of the doctrine as one that holds to tactual succession. This means that there has been an actual laying on of hands from the apostolic era to the present in an unbroken and continuous line. For this doctrine, what constitutes valid succession is the actual tactual succession and associated with this tactual succession is a deposit of grace. The ability to bring about the transubstantiation of the communion elements, absolve sin and more. Thus, a priest who leaves the church and becomes an atheist still has these powers. The powers go even to an evil man. During the medieval era, some men were ordained priests on one day and popes or bishops the next, who had previously been pirates, reprobates and the like. Dante put some popes in hell in his Inferno, but he did not deny their apostolic succession. We can make a further point about tactual succession. We find this doctrine almost always in the same churches which believe in baptismal regeneration. Basic to baptismal regeneration is the belief in the efficacy of the tactual act. Some Lutherans, Baptists and Campbellites have a belief in baptismal regeneration, and I have known one Presbyterian pastor who also held it. All these men had in common a belief in a deposit of grace being conferred by their church's form of tactual succession and ordination. A second doctrine of apostolic succession holds to spiritual succession. Wherever there is evidence of the apostolic faith, there is evidence of apostolic succession. The validity of the succession depends on being called of God and affirming the faith. This doctrine is more popular in name than in fact. Tactual succession is easily criticised. It was a popular doctrine with the Pharisees, and it did contribute to the erosion of faith in Judea. We have reference to it in John chapter 8, verse 33, as well as other texts, 
when the Pharisees justified themselves by saying, We be Abraham's seed, or, as John the Baptist encountered it, We have Abraham to our father. Matthew chapter 3 verse 9 However, to affirm the sole sufficiency of spiritual succession is an anarchic principle. There are all too many examples of men who have insisted, on the basis of their own personal sense of calling, on their right to preach, marry and give communion. There are all too many church disasters created by this principle, because every member feels an equal calling at times to assert authority. Some, but not all by any means, Anabaptists affirmed this purely spiritual succession. Best known among these were the Quakers, whose belief in the efficacy of the private call and succession led them into wild extravagances, private visions, and erratic behaviour. Calvin criticised the Roman Catholic view with no small intensity. He saw its relationship to the Jewish doctrine. Calvin used Augustine and Cyprian to insist on the necessity for sound doctrine and brotherly love. The early Anglican bishops held to a like emphasis. Bishop Jewell, in his answer to Harding, said, Succession, you say, is the chief way for any Christian man to avoid Antichrist. I grant you, if you mean the succession of doctrine. Both Calvin and the English bishops stressed the succession in the apostolic faith, but they did not thereby affirm the purely spiritual succession. Calvin, for example, cited Ephesians chapter 4 verses 4 to 16 as basic to an understanding of ordination and true succession. Paul in this text says, There is one body and one spirit, even as you are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all, and in you all. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore he saith, When he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive, and gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heaven, that he might fill all things. And he gave some apostles, and some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith, and of the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro, and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men, and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But, speaking the truth in love, may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying itself in love. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 4 to 16. Paul makes clear that the church is not only a collection of individuals, which it is, but also one body with one Lord, one faith, one baptism. It is not only the individual and his faith, but the one body and its faith. Calvin said of Paul's words, In this passage he shows that the ministry of men, which God employs in his government of the church, is the principal bond which holds believers together in one body. He also indicates that the church cannot be preserved in perfect safety unless it be supported by these means which God has been pleased to appoint for its preservation. Christ, he says, 
ascended up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 10 And this is the way in which he does it. By means of his ministers, to whom he has committed this office, and on whom he has bestowed grace to discharge it, he dispenses and distributes his gifts to the church, and even affords some manifestation of his own presence, by exerting the power of his spirits in this his institution, that it may not be vain or ineffectual. Calvin spoke strongly about this spiritual succession. No man can lawfully exercise this ministry without having been called by God. He was equally adamant that the election and appointment of bishops by men is necessary to constitute a legitimate call to office, and added that this no sober person will deny while there are so many testimonies of Scripture to establish it. This was substantially the earlier Catholic position. It was the doctrine of the Anglican bishops, and of most communions, in some form or another. Differences exist with regard to the details and offices, but we can call this third form of apostolic succession one that stresses a. a succession of doctrine, that is, the apostolic faith preached faithfully, and a spiritual call to that faith, and b. some form of tactual ordination and succession. Thus, in some form or another, Catholics, Lutherans, Anglicans, Presbyterians, Baptists and others hold to apostolic succession. Their definition of what that means differs, and they have not normally used the term. It is of the essence of the Christian Church that it affirms continuity with the apostolic Church, with the Bible, The question is the nature of that succession. The three basic forms are tactual, purely spiritual, and the combined emphasis on faith, calling, and the Church's tactual verification. To understand the unity of thought, let us look a little further into Calvin's thinking, which had the virtue of being systematic and usually consistent. Calvin spoke of the authority of the state as well as the church. Of civil authorities, he wrote, Here let no man deceive himself, for as it is impossible to resist the magistrate without, at the same time, resisting God himself, though an unarmed magistrate may seem to be despised with impunity, yet God is armed to inflict exemplary vengeance on the contempt offered to himself. Calvin clearly stressed very strongly the religious nature of authority in church, state, family, and everywhere. However, the resistance forbidden to private parties was, for him, a necessity on the part of civil authorities or magistrates. Resistance should be lawful, and in terms of authority. For though the correction of tyrannical domination is the vengeance of God, We are not, therefore, to conclude that it is committed to us who have received no other command than to obey and suffer. This observation I always apply to private persons. For if there be, in the present day, any magistrates appointed for the protection of the people and the moderation of the power of kings, such as were in ancient times the Ephori, who were a check upon the kings among the Lacedaemonians, or popular tribunes upon the consuls among the Romans, or the demarchy upon the senate among the Athenians, or with power such as perhaps is now possessed by the three estates in every kingdom when they are assembled. I am so far from prohibiting them in the discharge of their duty to oppose the violence or cruelty of kings that I affirm that if they connive at kings in their oppression of their people, Such forbearance involves the most nefarious perfidy, because they fraudulently betray the liberty of the people, of which they know that they have been appointed protectors by the ordination of God. For Calvin, thus, resistance to evil was a necessity and a duty, but only in terms of duly constituted authorities. 
Calvin stressed the necessity within the Church of recognising God's degrees or hierarchies of order and authority. The necessary functioning of the Church requires, he held, such regulation, and it is not an invention of men, but an institution of God himself. What we have today is anarchy, not order. Churchmen, whether Catholic, Episcopalian, Baptist, Presbyterian, or any other affiliation, give a verbal affirmation of their church's position while exalting their private claim to dissent to anarchic dimensions. Moreover, the premise of dissent is not, thus saith the Lord, but rather, I don't agree with that. In a sense, therefore, any discussion of apostolic succession is perhaps academic. It is obvious by now that the term apostolic succession is here used to mean the claim to biblical warrant, authority, and succession in some sense. Such a claim is not irrelevant and is basic to the faith. In fact, Paul, in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 4 to 16, does not assert that the church may be called one body. He rather declares that it is so. He does not summon us to come together in unity. Rather, he declares that the church is one body, the body of Christ. And we are either of him or we are not. The church is one Lord, one faith, one baptism. We can only be baptised into Christ. We are not baptised in the name of the Catholic or Baptist churches, but into the name of the triune God. Within the church there is a diversity of men and gifts, but, as Hodge pointed out, this diversity of gifts is not only consistent with unity, but is essential to it. The body is not one member, but many. In every organism, a diversity of parts is necessary to the unity of the whole. If all were one member, asks the Apostle, where were the body? The position, moreover, of each member in the body is not determined by itself, but by God. The eye does not make itself the eye, nor the ear the ear. It is thus in the church. The rule of Christ's gifts of grace and of place and function is not our merit, but the Lord's own good pleasure. The ascended Lord, as a conqueror, distributes gifts to his followers to enable them to triumph. The purpose of Christ's exaltation and gifts is that he might fill all the universe with his presence, power and rule. The gifts have a function, to bless us in our fulfilment of his purpose, to bring us to perfection. The standard of perfection for the church is complete conformity to Christ. Basic to the unity of the church is the kingdom of Christ. The theme of Judges is a clear statement of our current problem also. In those days there was no king in Israel. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Judges chapter 21 verse 25 Men today profess allegiance to a variety of churches, but their essential allegiance is too often to themselves. The consequence of this is the impotence of the church. If the triune God is our true source of power, as indeed only he can be, it is futile to seek power on any other terms. Apostolic succession means submission and a life in behalf of the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Jude verse 3 It means faithfulness to the triune God and to all God-given authorities within that succession of faith. It is a recognition that the Bible has more authority than we have, and that it alone confers authority. A faith with such a past and present alone has a future. 